Some can glow in the dark and swim in the ocean. But you won't believe what they do better than a preschooler. Eventually, pigs will rule the world. Plus, wolves. They're over 20% brainier than dogs. And they can change the shape of rivers with their teeth. But you're about to find out how they're less lethal to humans than tap water. I don't want to say stop drinking tap water, but it could kill you. And crows. They're as smart as dolphins. And can talk like parrots. Hi. 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 But when it comes to hunting down terrorists, they may be as effective as SEAL Team 6. They're not just paying attention to a few dangerous people, but they've got a whole network of people. This is where savage meets science. And wild becomes wow. This is everything you didn't know about animals. They can detect smells buried two stories underground. They can make sounds almost as loud as a jet engine. They've been known to weigh more than a 1969 Volkswagen Bug. And some can even glow in the dark. They snort. They squeal. And they're on every continent but Antarctica. They're pigs. Pigs are some of the most interesting, fascinating, awesome animals out there. They're incredibly clever. They're incredibly fast. They're curious. They're fun. They're great animals. But a lot of people don't see swine for the amazing animals that they are. So we're about to put pigs through a series of challenges. Mini aptitude tests designed to flip how we feel about our porcine pals. It's only fitting that the battle should begin with the biggest of all pig's foes. It's pig versus perception. The public's pretty incorrect in most of its perceptions about pigs. <laughs> they think of pigs as dirty. They think of pigs as, you know, sloppy. But pigs actually, in fact, are quite clean animals. Newborn piglets will leave their nest to relieve themselves elsewhere when they're only a few hours old. No diapers required. But if pigs are really so clean, then how do you explain this? It's not because they like to be dirty, it's because mud helps keep them cool. Which leads to something else we have wrong about pigs. Ever uttered the phrase, sweats like a pig? Well, here's why that makes no sense. Humans have about two to five million functional sweat glands under our skin. Chimpanzees, between two and 500,000. And the pig, zero. And what about the phrase, eats like a pig. That one might be okay. For round two of our piggy reprogramming, we're bringing in man's best friend. It's pig versus dog. More specifically, the dog's nose. For years, dogs have been used to sniff out everything from drugs to bombs and even people. But theirs is not the only nose in town. Pigs can detect smells from up to seven miles away and may be able to pick up odors as far as 25 feet underground. That's deeper than a lot of nuclear bunkers. Pigs may even be muscling in on some of dogs' territory. They're being trained to detect landmines and you know, to detect explosives. They have a really amazing sensory apparatus. So whose nose really knows better? 
One of the ways scientists measure an animal's ability to smell is by counting the number of genes in its DNA related to smell. For example, humans have 387 active olfactory genes. Our sense of smell is just okay. But dogs have more than twice that, with 811. As for pigs, they have a remarkable 1,113 active genes related to smell. And just how good is that? We had pigs that we trained to find a particular odor out of an array of 10 others. And we had pigs that could discriminate between mint, peppermint, and spearmint. Once they learned which odor they were trained to detect, they were 100% accurate every single time. So the winner of round two? I tell you what, pigs or dogs? Pigs or dogs? I'm picking a pig. <laughs> For round three, we're changing the way you think about pigs by taking a look at how they think about everything. It's a test of mental prowess. Pigs versus kids. <laughs> According to some studies, pigs are the fourth smartest creatures in the animal kingdom, ranking only behind dolphins, chimps, and elephants. But how do they stack up against humans? Piglets will recognize their own name just a few weeks after being born. It takes most human babies between five and seven months, but it gets more advanced. One of the things that I had to do for my PhD research was to teach pigs how to use computer tasks. Watch the screen. So in fact, we put pigs on a computer task that at that point in time was used to train non-human primates, rhesus monkeys, chimpanzees, and so on. Good. Uh, just to see if they can even get the concept of operating a joystick that moved a cursor on a screen. You watching the screen? And shock and awe, on that computer task, the pigs actually learned and performed at a rate that was comparable to monkeys. And not just monkeys. The pigs also learned the task at a much higher speed than three-year-olds who played the same game. But for undeniable proof that pigs are smarter than kids? We trained our pigs to put all their toys back into tubs when they were done. So watching pigs walk around a room, picking up basically dog toys and nicely carrying them back to their little tubs is highly entertaining to watch, too. <laughs> if that doesn't change the way pigs are perceived, consider this. They've been saving human lives for decades. And for round four, pigs are taking on human diseases. According to some research, many of the pigs' organ systems are 80 to 90% similar to our own. For years, doctors have researched using genetically modified pig hearts on humans in need of transplants. While primates are more closely related to us, Adult pig hearts are closer in size to our own, carry a lower risk of infection than other primate hearts, and can likely be transplanted regardless of blood type. And it's not just a theory. Researchers recently transplanted a heart from a genetically modified pig into a baboon. The next step will be pig to human. If successful, it could save up to 1,000 lives in the U.S. every year. But lately, scientists have been eliminating the pig's life-saving abilities like never before. Meet the pigs that glow in the dark. In 2005, researchers at the National Taiwan University injected pig embryos with bioluminescent DNA from jellyfish. The results? The world's first fully glowing pigs. Scientists are developing methods for extracting green glowing stem cells from these pigs to use for tracing diseases inside the human body. 
without the need for biopsies or other invasive procedures. Pigs haven't always been used with such sophistication. In the not-so-distant past, pigs were used as instruments of war, squaring off against other armored animals. Can you guess which of these other animals the pig has had to face on the battlefield? Is it A, tigers, B, elephants, or C, lions? Winston Churchill once said, dogs look up to us, cats look down on us, pigs treat us like equals. <laughs> to return the favor, we're putting the pig through a series of challenges designed to change how we think about these amazing animals. But first, before the break, we asked you which of these animals the pig has had to face off against on the battlefield. Is it A, tigers, B, elephants, or C, lions? The answer? It's the biggest of the big, the elephant. As early as 267 BC, the Romans deployed war pigs against the elephants of opposing forces. The loud squealing of the pigs would terrify the elephants and send them trampling back over their own troops. Pigs one, elephants zero. But how loud do you have to be to scare off a horde of battle-hardened pachyderms? It's pig versus a jet engine. At an ear-splitting 130 decibels, a pig squeal is four times louder than a chainsaw. Pigs are definitely um, among the loudest animals on the planet. It's pretty amazing and literally ear-rending. Pigs can squeal to the point where, yeah, you really can lose your hearing. If you're in a barn full of pigs and they're all squealing at the same time, what you may often hear, especially around feeding time, is a lot of vocalization. And it's really important that people wear hearing protection. But how does the pig squeal stack up against the sound of a jet engine? Put them both on a runway, and the engine will only drown out the pig by 10 decibels. To put that in perspective, that 10 decibel difference is only as loud as a pin dropping. So technically, jet engine wins this battle. But just wait until pigs learn to fly. The largest pig ever recorded was named Big Bill. He was five feet tall, nine feet long, and weighed a scale tipping 2,552 pounds. That's 700 pounds heavier than a 1969 Volkswagen Bug. Bill's size was definitely the exception, much to the relief of pig moms everywhere. Especially since pigs are the most prolific large mammals on Earth, with the average litter size equaling about 12 piglets. The biggest litter on record was 37 piglets. That's more than three defensive lines. In Iowa, pigs outnumber people seven to one. With roughly a billion pigs on Earth, it only makes sense that they should face off against each other. So to really change how you feel about swine, it's time to go back to the beginning. It's pig versus pig, the ultimate sibling rivalry. The fighting starts on day one. Pigs establish hierarchies very, very early on in life. And it, what's really cool and interesting about them that many people might not know is when they come out, piglets actually pick a teat and keep it and defend it virtually for their entire time that they're with their moms. And since the teats at the front of mom's body produce the most milk, the firstborn pigs claim those right away. They come out with these nasty little razor sharp needle teeth that they can use to basically fight each other off from, you know, within the first few minutes of life. It's sad to be the back end of the litter because one, odds are you're not gonna get a whole lot of milk, and two, you're probably gonna stay small relative to, uh, to your siblings. Little sisters never get any respect. 
If all of these challenges haven't changed the way you think about pigs, maybe it's time to take a trip to Pig Island in the Bahamas. Somewhere along the way, someone brought a few pigs to the island. Now, they call it home. These guys learn that if they swim out, they get close to boats, people throw food at them. It just shows how clever pigs are. Pigs in paradise. <laughs> they can solve puzzles better than some five-year-old children. <laughs> they hold funerals for their dead. They were part of the hunt for Osama bin Laden. They may just be the smartest birds in the world. Hello. 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 And they live in our own backyards. Ravens and crows are next. They've been known to eat humans. They never forget a face. And they've been trained to go to war. They're ravens and crows. But don't be scared. Crows also like to play like puppies. And they're as brainy as apes. Forget the parrot. Can you say hello? Hi. Crows and ravens might just be the smartest birds in the world. To back that statement up, we're examining all the ways in which crows and ravens transcend their scary rep by being so clever. And it all starts with this. Crows are smart enough to tell you off. Your ears do not deceive. Hello. Hello. Crows and ravens really can speak. And while Edgar Allan Poe turned talking blackbirds into something scary, the reality? I love you. When you raise captive crows, occasionally they will mimic people's voice. And often they only talk to one person. They're actually paying attention and trying to communicate, usually with that specific individual. Pet crows are said to get their owner's names in the form of specific sounds they only use around that person. I know, I know, right? But in the wild, crows have their own unique way of communicating. And their language may be richer than anyone ever realized. We know that crows and ravens have an extremely varied vocabulary, and a very rich vocabulary, with some calls that have very specific meanings. Crows even seem to have their own accents and regional dialects. It was the great philosopher Groucho Marx who said, I'd never forget a face, but in your case, I'll be glad to make an exception. Crows would probably appreciate that quote because, no joke, some of them are so smart, they never forget a face. In a first-of-its-kind study, University of Washington professor John Marsluff wanted to see if crows could recognize individual human faces, or at least human face masks. In Marsluff's experiment, researchers wore a mask designated as a dangerous face while trapping and tagging just seven crows. They are fearful, they are stressed out, they are thinking they're gonna die. The crows were then released, and to Marsluff's surprise, over three years later, the crows still freak out when they see the dangerous face, even if it's disguised with a hat. Even more incredible, though John only captured seven birds in the original experiment, over 70% of the crows on campus now react anytime the mask is around. That means that not only did the original seven birds remember the face, but they taught other crows to hate it too. I mean, it's like a culture has developed on our campus to hate this particular guy, this caveman. The alarm calling has increased in intensity over time. It has not faded. But if crows can single out one face in a school of 40,000 students, what else could they do with their power? 
That's what the Pentagon wanted to know when in the mid-2000s, they looked into using crows to hunt down the most wanted man in history. Even they knew. Crows are smart enough to hunt Osama bin Laden. Never mind SEAL Team 6. Crows might just be the future of covert warfare. When the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq were in full swing, the U.S. military funded research into using a network of spy crows to find soldiers missing in action by studying pictures of their faces. But it didn't stop there. Based on John Marsloff's research at the University of Washington, the government actually looked into whether they could be helpful in finding Osama bin Laden. If they could train local crows to hate bin Laden's face, like the campus crows hated Marsloff's mask, the angry birds might be able to confirm his location. So did crows and ravens have a part in capturing bin Laden in 2011? That's top secret. And this time, the crows aren't talking. For centuries, it was believed that true intelligent thought could only exist in mammalian brains. But in 2013, German neuroscientists discovered something strange in the crow's brain. Something that could lead to some incredible human advancements. Could what we know about the crow's brain help us A. Talk to aliens B. Create autonomous drones Or C. Look through walls with our phones Plus, find out what makes some crows smarter than chimps. In 2013, neuroscientists in Germany wired electrodes to the brains of crows and monitored them while the birds solved a series of complex memory tests. What they found could lead to a pretty amazing human advancement. Before the break, we asked you what that advancement might be. By studying a crow's brain, could we learn to A. Talk to aliens B. Create autonomous drones Or C. Look through walls with our phones As far out as it sounds, the answer is A. If aliens exist, crows might help us learn to communicate with them. The key is the bird's brain, which is the closest thing to alien intelligence that we know of. When us mammals are trying to reason something out, we use our prefrontal cortex. Birds have no prefrontal cortex. Their seat of reason is in a completely different part of the brain, known as the nedopallium caudolateral. Based on the German study, some people believe understanding how a brain so different than our own works could help us communicate with future visitors. Or at least build smarter scarecrows. As long as we're comparing brains in relation to the size of their bodies, crow and raven brains are about the same size as those of great apes. And just like these intelligent primates, the blackbirds can use tools. They may be better at it than any chimp. This is the New Caledonian crow. In the wild, this indigenous bird uses long sticks to reach tasty bugs. But they don't just use tools, they make them. They make hook tools, they make barb tools. You can teach a chimpanzee to do that, but they're not very good at it. Here, a crow named Betty tries to retrieve a little basket of food. But all she has is a straight piece of wire. With just a little thinking, she turns the wire into a hook. No one taught her to do it. She figured it out herself. I mean, she really had to have had a plan in her head of this is how this is going to work. And it went through step by step and the sequencing of a complex behavior. That implies insight. We don't associate it with many animals. 
what we do with, with this crow. Betty is currently earning a degree in IT tech repair. If crows are so smart, then why do so many people still look at them as symbols of fear? It may go back to the bubonic plague, when over 75 million people on three continents lay dead or dying. There are no vultures in Northern Europe. So that's the crows and ravens that ate the dead. You'd have a crow or raven come right onto your deck and eat a piece of bread. And two minutes later, it could be eating your neighbor, who happened to have died from the plague. But crows have come a long way since then. Today, if they want to grab a meal, it's a little easier. Because when it comes to getting food, crows and ravens are regular Einsteins. In just one four-month breeding season, a small family of crows can eat over 40,000 bugs. That's more than the entire population of Moscow, Idaho, in bugs. But it's not all grubs and worms for crows. They also like to eat what we eat. From leftover Chinese food to this. They can fish. Some crows drop bait in the water and wait for fish to come up and then grab them. Bon appetit. A taste for the finer things in life isn't the only way crows are like us. After a hard day's work, they like to cut loose, too. Yes, that crow is sledding. And it doesn't stop there. They'll play fetch, frolic in the snow, and swing around on branches if there's nothing better to do. Play is a very beneficial activity. It helps establish social relationships, relieve stress. It's beneficial for animals just like it's beneficial for us. It's one of the ways they keep the family together. And when it comes to family, crows may be as advanced as humans. Fall in love, move to the burbs, raise some kids. It's the American dream. And for many crows, it's the same story. American crows have a social system that is more similar to Western society humans than probably any other animal on Earth. For instance, American crows mate for life. Crow couples stake out a piece of territory to raise their young. And when unclaimed real estate is hard to come by, crow kids will often live with their parents to help raise their younger siblings. Or as we humans call it, freeloading. Those gangs of crows you see in your neighborhood, they're actually families with mom and dad and kids from a number of different years. They're all hanging together and, and uh, watching out for each other. And they really come together when there's a death in the family. Because when it comes to the end, crows and ravens may actually hold funerals for their dead. When they see a dead crow on the ground, uh, they will swarm around that. It's a social gathering on a huge level. There could be a thousand birds even that, that gather around some of these situations. And according to observers, it seems to be much more than just morbid curiosity. They've described the crows processing by the body, bringing sticks around the body, or just a gathering in the trees that is very noisy. And then the birds disperse silently. So maybe it's time we all pay our respects to the brainy birds in our backyard. One pack can dominate a territory the size of Delaware. They're being studied by the Navy to create robots of war. 
They're resistant to anthrax, can hunt for three days straight, and without them, trees will die. These are no puppies. They're wolves. Next. It's late on the M23 highway in southern Russia. Traffic cops stop a man with a burnt-out headlight. The officer is prepared to let the driver go with a warning, but then... He gets a warning of his own. Something is stirring in the shadows. There's only seconds to run. The wolves are coming. From Little Red's grandma to those three sheltered pigs, we've learned to fear the big bad wolf. But put away those silver bullets, because we're revealing four reasons to choose respect over revulsion when it comes to wolves. Our first reason to respect the wolf is simple, because they respect us. It's easy to understand why some people might not see it this way. Prior to the 20th century, wolves killed 681 people in France alone. But that was then. In North America, there have been only two fatal wolf attacks in the past 100 years. To put that in perspective, in the US alone, roughly 20 people are killed every year by cows. 100 people are killed annually by scalding tap water. That means your average faucet kills 98 more people in one year than wolves have killed in an entire century. Wolves are not really a threat unless you mm, put yourself in a really precarious situation by getting too close. So keep your distance and wolves will mind their own business. Whether it's the jumping Jack Russell or a bounding black lab, all domestic dogs come from gray wolves. Even now, there's only a 0.2% difference between the DNA of a domestic dog and a gray wolf. But it's a mistake to treat these predators like puppies. Because contrary to what some people believe, wolves deserve much more respect than that. To be fair, wolves may have started this misconception themselves. Wolves domesticated themselves to hang out with people so that they could get our garbage, our refuse, and our table scraps. The more docile wolf with the smaller teeth, the floppier ears, the shorter face, people would have tolerated them. And so over time, their noses have shrunk, their teeth have shrunk, their behavior has changed dramatically from wild wolves. But wolves in the wild have remained very much the same. They're not docile, they're not domesticated, they're not dogs. They're bigger, over two times bigger than the beefiest German Shepherd. They're smarter. Wolves' brains are up to 30% larger, making them too clever to train. Some researchers believe domestic dogs only ever develop to the mental stage of a 10 to 30 day old wolf puppy. So because of their cunning and unpredictability, it's probably a good thing that it's illegal in all 50 states to own a pure wolf as a pet. I don't know if I'd want a 180 pound badass killer living in my, in my living room. Then again, tap water could kill me. Okay, maybe, maybe I'll get a wolf for Christmas. In January of 2013, the Sokka Republic of Siberia declared a state of emergency. 
an unprecedented super pack of over 400 wolves invaded a small town of 1,300 people. That's almost one wolf for every three residents. In just four days, the super pack killed 30 horses. Some believe the wolves were driven together because of a decline in their usual prey. And a giant pack like this is extremely rare. But the truth is, even small packs are something to be respected. In Alaska, one small pack of just 10 wolves controlled a territory of about 2,500 square miles for years. That's bigger than Delaware. Wolf packs are so good at hunting together, even the Department of Defense respects their force. In 2014, DARPA launched Project CODE, which stands for Collaborative Operations in Denied Environment. The goal is to mimic the way coordinated wolf packs hunt with minimal communication, to create semi-autonomous military drones that can enter enemy airspace, then work together to evade and attack. By the time the plan is fully implemented in 2018, the total cost will be $54.3 million. For years, researchers gave the leader in a wolf pack the title Alpha Wolf. It seemed to make sense. Webster's even defines alpha as having the most power in a group of animals or people. But recently, there have been some changing thoughts about the term alpha wolf. Can you guess which of the following statements about alpha wolves is true? The alpha wolf is A, the most physically fit, B, the firstborn, or C, a lie. Plus, true or false, werewolves exist? In 1951, 135 French people were hospitalized and six people died after being attacked by werewolves. Either that, or they were suffering from violent mass hallucinations brought on by a rare fungus in rye bread called ergot that creates crazed delusions of turning into beasts. Some scholars now believe at least a few of our modern werewolf legends came from true tales of medieval peasants infected by this same fungus and having visions of turning into beasts. So maybe the only thing you really need to fear during a full moon is moldy bread. Before the break, we asked you which of these statements about alpha wolves is true. Is the alpha wolf A, the most physically fit, B, the firstborn, or C, a lie? The truth is, according to more recent research, the term alpha wolf is C, a lie. There's no such thing. Not how we think about it anyway. So a lot of packs are essentially family groups. So what most people would call mom and dad, we're calling, you know, the alpha wolf and his lady friend. <laughs> So they gave us dogs. But what else are wolves good for? Even President Teddy Roosevelt, regarded as a hero to conservationists, famously called wolves a beast of waste and destruction. So for our fourth and final reason to respect the wolf, we look at a world without them to see if it would really be a better place. Yellowstone, the world's first national park. Nearly 35,000 square miles of pristine nature, with 67 different species of mammals, 322 different birds, and countless rare plants and trees, it is a true Eden on Earth. At least, it is today. Between 1914 and 1926, under pressure from cattle and livestock industries, Congress allowed the last of Yellowstone's 136 wolves to be hunted into extinction. And 
then the unexpected happened. The land started changing. The trees began to disappear. A little over two decades after wolves, new tree growth drops to just 10% of what it was before their absence. 50 years after wolves and those same trees are down to just 1%. Trees that once grew up to 98 feet tall now rarely reach a height beyond two feet. That's like turning the Sears Tower into a four-story building. One of the major reasons the trees aren't growing? They're being devoured by one of the wolves' favorite meals, the elk. If you're an elk in Yellowstone, things are great. Elk will eat anything that's up to about seven feet tall. So if you have a sapling that is growing up and hasn't made it to seven feet yet, elk can come along and just eat it, and that tree will not become an adult and reproduce more trees. Without wolves to help keep them in check, the elk population explodes to 19,000 strong. And with each elk devouring 10 to 20 pounds of plants per day, that's 380,000 pounds of species-supporting habitat eaten every 24 hours. To put it in human terms, that would be like losing two to four single-level houses every day. The entire town of Danville, Iowa, would be wiped off the map in as little as three months. Riverbanks start to crumble without the roots of trees and plants to hold them together. The beaver population that depends on the rivers and the dwindling trees drops from 25 colonies to just one. Even grizzlies, one of Yellowstone's biggest draws, seem to be disappearing, which only disrupts the food chain further. 70 years after their eradication, and this world without wolves is dying. But then, in 1995, thanks to provisions in the Endangered Species Act, two wolf packs are reintroduced to Yellowstone. The impact is palpable. In just a little over 10 years, elk populations dropped 50.3% to a more sustainable 7,000 heads. But it may be more than just how wolves kill elk. Some studies suggest they also keep them running so they can't overgraze any one area. And less elk competing for food means more bison. In the years after wolves return, bison populations in Yellowstone double from under 1,000 to over two. And because wolves eat big game animal, they actually were leaving behind carrion that were being scavengered by ravens, bald eagles, and even bears. So there was an increase in the bear population. 15 years after the return of wolves, and even the shape of rivers start to change. Deeper roots mean stronger soil and more defined riverbanks. Yellowstone goes from having one beaver colony to over 100. While there are other factors at play, the wolves' impact on Yellowstone's biodiversity is undeniable. After the return of top predators like wolves, Yellowstone begins to recover. This interconnectedness is known to scientists as a trophic cascade and it goes beyond Yellowstone. From Glacier National Park to the Smoky Mountains, wolves are a vital part of a complex ecosystem. And if that's not reason enough to respect the wolf, what is?